I think the unmet need is the biomarker. I think that that's the first unmet need. We do not have, in my mind, and you could ask medical oncologists and they may give you different answers, um, that, that we don't have a reliable biomarker um, yet. I think pd one is good, but I certainly don't think it's perfect. It's not fixed like an EGFR mutation. It's dynamic. Uh, so I think the search and the work needs to be done to better define patients. And then we have to remember, even with combination strategies, we are not, we are not getting cure. And that's what we really want. We want rational combination strategies that are safe uh, and that, that can lead to long-term outcomes. So if you look at the data with uh, CTLA-4 antibodies with, with PD-1 drugs, depending on the data you look at, the response rate can be anywhere from 20% all the way to 70%, depending on a small number of patients versus large number. And so we still have a lot of work to do in that space. Um, I would say that per perhaps another unmet need is how these drugs work in the curative setting, just like targeted therapies. You know, we have to explore immunotherapy post lung cancer resections as adjuvant treatment. Um, and an arm of the Alchemist study, a very large study, uh, a national effort, is going to look at this, uh, giving a, a nivolumab uh, uh, for patients after chemotherapy to see if, you know, can these drugs lead to better cures? And then also in the neoadjuvant setting, giving it before surgical resection. You'd have identified an early stage lung cancer patient, um, giving these drugs before surgical, uh, them going to surgery and seeing what they do to the tumor. So those are, I think, I, I've said this before, I think we are, we are really in an era uh, that we've just begun to understand. We are in its infancy in terms of really understanding the fascinating, complex interplay between the immune system and cancer. It is not the targeted therapy paradigm. This is very different. This is a whole different animal. Um, as somebody who has an interest in immunology and somebody who has privy to the data, even someone like myself, I struggle with trying to understand how these are all working together. And I also struggle to understand every single new combination that's out there and why they're doing it that way. I think breakthrough designations are reflective and indicative of how many good trials and good therapies uh, we're now delivering to patients. And I think that's very exciting. Uh, as I said before, we've had, I think, nine to 10 either immunotherapies, monoclonal antibodies, or targeted therapies approved for lung cancer in the past five years. Um, and breakthrough designations, uh, that phrase is reflective of a changing paradigm. I mean, six, seven years ago, we had two or three drugs that we used in lung cancer. It is fascinating to see the groundswell of therapies and all the different treatment options. So I think having these breakthrough designations and the FDA doing, I think, due diligence, but yet getting them accelerated for approval based on the, the, the trials are, it's a win. It's a win for doctors. It makes doctors' lives a little harder because there's more options, but that's good for patients. Patients who have more options, um, uh, it, it's a win. It's gonna extend survival for these patients. I think if we look from 10, na 10, 10 years from now, uh, or even five years from now, we'll see median survival times for stage four patients truly moving in the right direction. The metric for what should be used as an endpoint for a clinical trial is evolving. If this question were to be posed to me five years ago, I would of course said overall survival. Uh, but things are changing. Uh, and I think the NCI has logged on to this too. Uh, that response rate may be enough to get drugs approved. The problem is, is that you're defining rare genotypes in lung cancer and you're not gonna have enough patients to do a phase three study. And if you have a great drug that works very well in a rare but you know, susceptible molecular niche cohort and response rates are 50 to 60 to 70%, you don't need that phase three trial for overall survival. Um, we don't have a ROS1, we have an approval for crizotinib for ROS1, a rare rearrangement lung cancer that has nothing to do with a phase three trial. It was a response rate that was quite high. We'll never be able to do a phase three trial in that setting. So I think their overall survival is still very meaningful, um, but we need to consider for these rare genotypes um, that we're picking up on comprehensive genomic profiling, a response rate as a potential surrogate to get drugs approved.